and welcome to another episode of Feeding Under Fire. My name is Simon Walker, I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Dunkley and today I'm going to be talking to you about officers food. Now, officers food is very different than the food that I've been making so far and the reason for this is that Ranker's food or the you know, Toggy's food tended to be made in, in vats uh, en masse so it could be served out to them in the canteens or on the front line but officers food was made very differently because it tended to be made by batsmen or even cooks and it was at the officers preference of what they actually ate so this gives me a bit of a problem because it means it's very difficult to work out exactly what they were eating so today i'm going to be making welsh rarebit with ale and a rum omelette and the reason i chose these particular dishes is these were the dishes that company commander Graham Greenwell served at a party that he gave in January 1916. Okay, let's give it a go. Okay, so to make the recipe itself, what you're gonna need is one teaspoonful of butter for the pan. You're gonna need half a pound of cheese. Now the original recipe said American cheese, I'm using a cheddar mix. You need a third of a teaspoon of salt, we need some grains of cayenne. We need um, one teaspoon of mustard, one egg, half a cup of ale, and you're going to need some bread. And it's as simple as that. That's all we need. Now, this recipe was supposed to be made with a chafing dish, um, but since A, I don't have one, and B, I think it's unlikely that it would be made so extravagantly at the front, I'm settling for a saucepan. So as you can see, this wasn't the kind of usual fare that rankers would be used to. This was very much a different meal. And this particular meal was actually taken from a 1909 cookbook by Janet Mackenzie Hill, uh, in which she argues that she is bringing the skill back into cooking. And this maybe was, well, this could have been one of the cookbooks um, that cooks and, and Batman may have been using, even officers themselves might have been using at the time. So what I'm doing here is I'm mixing the egg and the ale and all the ingredients together to give it this kind of lovely, lovely colour. I'm not going to say what that, that actually looks like. But, um, and at the same time, heating the, the meat and butter up on the, on the cooker. Um, <clears throat> But it's clear how food was such a, a designator of status in the First World War. And it's interesting, if you look at the October 1914 article in the Journal of the Royal Army Medical Corps by W. Beveridge, it claimed that cheese was essential for bringing up the calorie intake of soldiers. But Beveridge notes that cheese doesn't keep, so they had to find an alternative. But for the officers, cheese was very much available. And the reason for this is that officers could actually source their own food. Um, Oxford educated Second Lieutenant Greenwell shows this in his very early letters back to his mother in 1915, because he describes getting chocolates and the duck's cheese uh, that they were eating. Um, a friend of his had had a parcel delivered and it had all these wonderful things in it. And he writes to his mother and says, well, you know exactly what I like from my Harris parcel. And Greenwell seems to present the entire war as some kind of adventure. Um, because he writes, Connie took me round this afternoon and I went through all our trenches with him. They are the most weird and quite different from what one expects. Not a long continuous line, but all zigzagged anywhere and very bad ones. I looked through all the telescopes and peepholes, I had a quick look at the German trenches around the corner, they were only about 40 yards away, and it was most interesting and amusing. I kept meeting all my old friends around different corners. We had tea in a little dugout with six other officers in the trench, cakes galore and jam, very pleasant. Horny had three or four pop shots with a rifle through the peephole. Now, this story by Greenwell is certainly not the case for every single officer. But, tea, cake, 
a little bit of cheeky shooting at the enemy. Okay, so now we've got the Welsh Rabbit out of the way, we're going to move on to the second recipe, which is the Rum Omelette. Now, I really like this recipe, I think it's quite funny. Uh, it's taken from a 1915 Belgian cookbook. Uh, in which it's side it's written that this uh, recipe is very much favoured by gentlemen. Um, so, what are the gentlemen eating? Well, they have five five eggs. They've got what it says in the recipe as a sherry glass of rum and some caster sugar, and that's it. That's all that's gone into this. So, as you can see, the recipe says that the uh, the eggs need to be beaten. So I've done a little bit of beating already. I'm going to add in the sugar. And it doesn't say how much sugar is going in. So I used about a uh, tablespoon's worth of sugar, a little bit over. And then you've got your rum. Pour your rum in. And then we're just going to mix that together to make it, it says, um, until it's froth. So give it a nice bit of mixing. And then we're going to cook it for about three minutes. Of course, it wasn't all champagne, oysters, and sugar for the officers. In fact, some officers had to muck in with their men and eat the same things, eat rations and such. And one such officer was Lieutenant Harold Cronin of the 5th Bedfordshire Regiment, who had to muck in with the men and eat rations. And he writes in his diary, We got plenty of bully beef and army biscuits, but bread and fresh meat is still a luxury and it's not possible to buy anything. It must have been a no man's land because there are no houses or buildings of any kind to be seen, except the flies. The only living things are green canary and lizards. And Cronin certainly wasn't alone. Lieutenant Lindsay wrote to his mom in 1915 to tell her, we were supplied with dry ration, which consists of a tin of corned beef and a bag of biscuits, which are hard about the size of a shilling and quite palatable. And again, Major W. Nicholson claims in his memoirs that he had to eat rations. And he says that, I never remember being starving, although there were occasions when a very hard biscuit and jam became the most welcome and enjoyable. So it seems, for these officers, it wasn't all parties, champagne and rum omelette, but in fact they had to muck in. But the point here is that it was very much the exception that they would have to eat the rations or eat the same as their men. They certainly had options that the average Tommy didn't. Okay, so the food is all prepared and I probably should say we, with the Welsh rabbit, you saw me put the ale into the egg. Um, the original recipe it said to add the ale into the cheese, but I also saw another recipe uh, which came from five years later that said that it was better to add the ale to the egg, so I thought I'd give it a shot. And it seems to have worked out quite well. So, I'm very lucky today um, to have my friend Mark McKenzie with me. Hello. He's going to be my officer for uh, for this taste session, and he, he, you're not looking forward to this, are you? Not at all. No. Okay. What What are you least looking forward to? Rum omelette. The the rum omelette. Rum omelette. Okay. Is not my thing. <laughs> well, so we try the Welsh rabbit first. Yes. Right. Okay. Give that a shot and see what it is. So the Welsh rabbit is essentially um, it's it's kind of posh cheese on toast, but it's got ale in it as well. Was ale a luxury that the officers were only able to get? That's that's a good question. Ale and beer was um, quite common for soldiers and officers, but probably quantity and quality would have been different for the officers. And indeed, if you want to find out more about alcohol, you should watch the upcoming uh, shorts on drinking that are, that are coming up soon, as soon as I make them. What do you think? It's interesting. <laughs> now, you've had my cooking before. I've heard you say interesting. Yeah, it's done. It's definitely a, a bit of class of standard to what standard soldiers must have had access to. It absolutely is, yeah. Uh, there's more ingredients in it, uh, there's more variety in it, there's different flavours in it and so forth. Than, and you couldn't have made this in a bat. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. I quite like it. A bit of comfort. 
Yeah, I mean, this was very much a quality food. As, as I said, this was part of a party. This, both of these, including the champagne, um, which, by the way, is not Moet champagne at all, because I can't afford it. It is champagne, and we'll just leave it there, shall so. we? Um, but it, this was all part of a party, and they had the, the Welsh rabbit, and they also had the omelet. So, do you want to try the omelet? Yeah. <laughs> Now the omelette was supposed to be flambe, and what you missed off camera was me not being able to set fire to it, so I'm kind of disappointed with it. But there is a lot of sugar, there's a lot of rum, and there's egg in it. Yeah. It's not as dreadful <laughs> as I was anticipating. Oh, why? What do you think it was going to taste like? Like rum? <laughs> like pure rum out the bowl? Well, there is a lot of rum in it. There's um, also a lot of sugar. It's a big, very, very sweet omelette. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure whether this is the dessert or whether it's a main meal because it's so sweet. Uh, it's certainly on the menu if something comes further down. Um, it may have possibly been both, but the amount of sugar in it and the sugar and eggs, it's more like, it was more like making a cake than yeah. it was than, than making a savoury food. Good, so you like it? I like the rhubarb. Yeah? I would not eat that. You wouldn't eat that? No. But uh, mark that a 10 for the rabbit? I would give that a lieutenant of 10. Yeah. He practiced that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you like it. But <clears throat> what's quite interesting uh, about the officer's food is one of my favourite stories from my research of the last four years in the First World War actually comes from a ranker who found out to managed to get one over on his officer because he and a friend um, were in a dugout and next to them there was an officer in, in, in his batsman. And Private Warsop tells the story of how he, before they went on the front, they knew they were going to be out there for a while so they went and kind of raided the stores and they had food and they had sandwiches and things. They kind of looked after themselves. But the officer had left it to his batsman to do it. And the conversation goes that Warsop heard him say, heard the officer say to his batsman, um, Audley, have you got any bread? No, sir. Um, have you got any biscuits? No, sir. Have you got anything to eat at all? No, sir. And then the orderly then gets this massive berating from his officer for not giving any food. One walks up and he's made, sat in the trench, happily eating sandwiches. And I quite like it because it's like one of the only times I've ever seen that like rankers actually got something decent to eat, whereas the officers did it's a big army of the trenches. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very well. Well, so I had to survive like a soldier for a day. Yeah, just for a day. Um, but I think that's the point that he usually had the choice not to. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for, for harping there. Yeah. I had to uh, drink something for you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for watching this episode of Feeding Under Fire. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been very interesting. And I uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks very much.